What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to episode two. We're going to go back to 1996. There was a promo that Arn Anderson cut. He talked about Chris Benoit's obsession with Kevin Sullivan. The fact of the matter is, Chris, there's going to come a time, and it's not that far down the road. You see, I've got more age in years. I've got more age in the business, in this great sport. And age denotes wisdom. There's going to come a time in my life and in your life when there's no more cameras, no more TV lights, no more people running up to you at the mall saying, can I have your autograph? And whether you walk away from this great sport or whether you limp away or whether they roll you away in a wheelchair, the one constant will always be in your life is your family. They're there. They pat you up when you're hurt. They prop you up. They build your ego up, and they send you back out that door. Well, Chris, I'm just going to ask you one time. Is this obsession with destroying every aspect of Kevin Sullivan's life worth losing your soul? Well, is it? Wow. Now, that's what I call eerie. Very, very eerie. Of all the things Arn could have said in that promo... He basically brought up Chris's family, which obviously at the end, it's about Chris's family. He brought up Kevin Sullivan, which I very much think was about Kevin Sullivan, too. And he brings up, if you don't get over this obsession with Kevin Sullivan, is it worth losing your soul? Well, is it? Well, why do you have to lose your soul in all of this? And I know what people are going to say. Oh, come on. That's just a promo. Arn Anderson didn't know what was going to happen. There's no way Arn Anderson would have thought Chris Benoit would really die or would have entertained or crossed into his mind that Chris was really going to be dead like that. The only problem is, I think Chavo Guerrero tells us of another example when Arn Anderson predicted Chris Benoit's death yet again. I remember Arn Anderson saying, you know what, if Benoit didn't show up with no word, he's either has just taken off to like Alaska and mm-hmm. he's going to be like a, you know, a merchant Marine or something, or he's, or he's dead. Basically. That's, and, and, I remember and, him saying that not meaning it. It's like, what do you mean? Not meaning it. He said, Chris, if he's not, Chris is not here. He's dead. That's uh, how else could he mean it? How else could he say it? You know, of all the possibilities, why does death have to be the ultimate one? Why someone wouldn't be at work? Maybe they got kidnapped. Maybe they got held hostage, taken hostage. You know, because at this point, Chavo hadn't told anybody in the company about the text messages he had been getting, which is very suspicious in of itself. Waited, what, 30 something hours to even say something. Uh, And that's from the last text message that he got. Because he got them at, what, five, four or five in the morning on Sunday, the day of vengeance, June 24th, 2007. Didn't say anything till that next day, Monday, around 11, 12. Didn't say anything to company officials until that time. And so it's like, first of all, why are you waiting so long to say something to somebody? Why are you withholding this? Oh, I was trying to cover for Chris. Cover for what? Cover for what? You said yourself and Chavo in, in interviews has said Chris sounded groggy, didn't sound like himself, sounded like he forced an I love you. So there were many signs there where Chavo even admitted that he picked up on that, that something didn't seem right. But he was covering for Chris. That's very odd. Arn Anderson predicting and saying Chris Benoit's dead. That's really strange. 
These are not normal behaviors. You know, it just seems really weird to me how all of this played out. But we're not done with Arn Anderson just yet. I want to go to an interview Black Bart gave where he talked about some behind the scenes stuff with Chris Benoit and Arn Anderson. They're bringing him into WCW as as the, the, a, a horseman, one of the horsemen. Bart, go put him over. Yes, sir. I'll go put him over. Me and Chris have a background in Japan that unless you was on them tours, you didn't, you know, you don't, you don't see them matches over here. Me and Benoit went out there, brother, and just Benoit said, just, I said, brother, they, they no, they want you to, to, he said, no, just have a regular match. Just like me and you've been in an angle for a year. I said, brother, we can't, we can't, we, we, we yeah, we can, yeah, let's do it, Mark. Let's just go show them. Brother, me and him went out there and we pulled that place down. Anyway, one, two, three, Chris, I, does something where Chris comes off the, the top rope. I catch him, we, we flip, but then we flip again and he comes up on top anyway. One, two, one, two three, I come up matter and he's, he's, he scoots. Iron Anderson is sitting in the dressing room door and he, I mean, Iron comes up and gets in my face right, he's this close and he's just screaming. Yeah, we're going to put him as one of the horsemen. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. You're this big train. I said, I said, I start, and Chris just went, just moved me over to the side. Got right up in Art's face and said, you're pissed off because nobody in this dress room can follow that. So Arn got really, really angry because Chris Benoit and Black Bart had a good match. Such a good match that nobody in the locker room could follow it, according to Chris Benoit. What that proves right there is Chris Benoit and Arn Anderson had backstage heat. And I would be inclined to believe it, it was because of the Kevin Sullivan, Nancy Sullivan thing. Now, I understand that Kevin Sullivan goes around in these shoot interviews and says him and Nancy were separated for eight months. I have no ill will to Chris because I wasn't with her for eight months. Right, okay. If anybody told me it was going to be him because he had just had a child, second child, I never thought what was going to happen would happen. And I still don't. Nobody knows what happened. Those three people are gone. Now, on paper, that sounds fine and dandy. You know, they were separated for eight months. Kevin didn't have a problem with it. The problem I have with it is what Kevin Sullivan's own best friend, Mike Graham, had to say about Chris Benoit. Kevin was hired as a booker. His wife, Miss Nancy, had been having an affair with Benoit right. the whole time they were on the road together. That's an ultimate sin in the wrestling business. First of all, I do apologize for that audio. Um, the interview used to be up on YouTube, and for some reason they took it down, so I found a guy who had reacted to it, and that's the best I could do, but I wanted to get that audio out there. And it brings up a big, big question. On one hand, Kevin Sullivan is saying that it really didn't bother him for Chris Benoit to take his wife. On the other hand, Kevin Sullivan's best friend, Mike Graham, maybe he didn't get the memo to downplay it and pretend like it wasn't really a thing. But Mike Graham is very much saying it's, it's the ultimate sin. You do not do that. You do not sleep with another man's wife. You understand? So it seems to me it bothered Mike Graham more than it did Kevin Sullivan, or maybe there's more to to it than meets the eye or the ear in this case, based on what Kevin Sullivan's telling us. I was driving with Kevin. It was very uncomfortable. I don't know when it got real and when it got and, and when it wasn't. Um, but there were several uncomfortable situations that I was that I was in that um, uh, that not for any fault of any of the parties, just, you know, the way things happened there was uh, several uncomfortable situations that i was put in that uh i obviously wish that i wasn't a part of but uh unfortunately i was and the rest is history for those who aren't familiar with who that guy is that was just talking that's dave penzer former wcw ring announcer and he was saying that he would ride with kevin sullivan and it became to a point to where it got uncomfortable around kevin chris nancy 
So I go back to this whole thing of if it's like Kevin says, and they were separated for eight months and Kevin didn't care, didn't have any ill will towards Chris. Why would there be awkwardness? Why would it why would it be such a problem and such a thing that even Dave Penzer noticed? On top of that, Kevin Sullivan's former boss, Eric Bischoff, reflected back on those days when this whole thing was going on. And his take on it does not back up what Kevin Sullivan says. It's it's really funny to me how all these guys that were around Kevin Sullivan are telling a different story than that of what Kevin Sullivan is saying. And in a court of law, if you were to have witness testimony like this, and they're contradicting what your main witness or, or, or let's just be honest, what the uh, defendant, because a lot of people think Kevin Sullivan did it. And if his excuse is, I didn't mind that Chris took my wife, but yet Mike Graham says, well, it was it was the ultimate sin. Dave Penzer says there was uh, awkward situations. It wasn't, you know, I don't know when it was real and when it wasn't. And then for Eric Bischoff to say this. It was a surreal situation, one that I had never experienced before. So there was no template as to how to handle it. But obviously, you know, the the storyline with Benoit and and Nancy Sullivan and and Kevin went from being, you know, art or, or, or life imitating art or art imitating life. I'm not even sure which at this point. It's so confusing. But when, anytime you weave, you know, a personal relationship into a storyline, I, I don't want to say in, not every time, but it's likely to affect the people involved. In this case, clearly it did with devastating ramifications. Add to that, I hope Kevin isn't offended when I say this publicly. I don't think he would be. But Kevin, in order to get through a lot of his shit, was self-medicating, which only made everything worse. So, yeah, I gave him time off. And there it is. From Eric Bischoff's own mouth, the consequences of that storyline had devastating ramifications. See, that's not that's not what Kevin Sullivan's telling people. That's not the story he's putting out there. And for him, I'm sure in his own eyes, if he comes across as this guy that was bitter and angry and had problems and had to be laid off from his job because he was taking pills, because he was so depressed and he was so down and it got to him so much, along with other stresses of the job, but to sit there and say that it didn't bother you for Chris Benoit to take your wife because you were separated for eight months and your own boss says this? You're a fucking liar. And it wouldn't hold up in a court of law. And that's why I wonder why, how come they didn't investigate Kevin Sullivan? They would have found all these holes, all these lies that I found so easily. And all I had to do was look on the internet. Imagine if I got to talk to these people and the questions that I would ask them. It would be it would be quite telling to see the answers they would give, because I guarantee you it wouldn't be a cakewalk. And speaking of Kevin Sullivan and his lies, I got one more that I'm going to play of Kevin Sullivan and Mike Graham to prove what liars the both of them are. I, I never had a problem with Chris until the very end when I put the belt on him. Somehow they thought I was going to, uh, he, somehow he thought I was going to screw him putting the world title on him. How and so? I, I don't know. But do you know how hard it was? I brought Sid Vicious in the room, that six nine. And I said to him, you're going to lose to Chris Benoit tonight. And he said, I'm losing to a midget. I said, Those are his exact words? Yeah. I said, listen, the kid deserves it. He's worked hard. I want to put the belt on him. And it's an olive branch for me. Now, I know I said I was going to follow it up with Mike Graham. And I'm, I will play the audio of what he had to say as well. But I, f I forgot about this part. Kevin Sullivan admitted that he was offering Chris Benoit an olive branch. He told this to Sid. 
because Sid apparently said I'm losing to a midget, which we'll get to that in a minute as well. We got we, we have Sid Vicious interview where he pretty much denies having a problem losing to Benoit. Uh, he didn't necessarily agree with it, but he didn't have a problem with it. So that's not exactly what Kevin Sullivan's saying there. However, when you offer and you know and extend an olive branch, that means something that someone does in order to show they want to stop arguing. The olive branch is often used as a sign meaning peace. So if you never had a problem with Chris until the end, why would you offer a sign of peace? This motherfucker can't even tell the truth without contradicting himself because he's a liar. And I, and I don't have to tell you he's a liar. I will send it eventually to someone who work with Kevin Sullivan, that being Perry Saturn, who knows Kevin and Mike are both liars. But we'll play the Mike Graham clip first about how, oh, Kevin was Benoit's biggest pusher. And then we'll follow it up with Perry Saturn on exactly how good they were to Benoit and Saturn. We were in, Kevin got the booking job. We were in, I want to say, Cincinnati or something. Benoit beats Sid Vicious for the world's title. We go to uh, Cleveland or something the next day. J.J. Dillon comes walking in. No, not J.J., but they had given the uh, the accountant, nice guy. Bob, uh, Bob, Bob Duke, not Bob Duke. Not, not Bob Duke. Uh, Bill Bush. Bill Bush. Right. Bill Bush. They they made Bill Bush the boss. Uh, some TV guys and whatever got this big push to get rid of Eric Bischoff because Eric had been flailing and, and whatever. So they fire Eric Bischoff and put Bill Bush in as the boss. So Kevin puts the world championship, world title on Benoit. Bill Bush comes in the dressing room with Kevin and I, and he said, guys, he said, I, he said, I, I, I know what I'm going to do, but I just want to tell you. He said, Benoit, Guerrero, uh, Perry Saturn, uh, and somebody else said, they're all going to leave if, if I don't fire Kevin and you and J.J. Dillon. I said, what? said, quote, unquote, Benoit said he can't trust his career in Kevin's hands. I said, Kevin, against everybody, put the world's title on him last night. And he said, well, I'm, I'm going to let him go, but I just want you to know the ultimatum that they just gave me. I said, really? So I walked out of the dressing room. I found Benoit. I took him sat his ass down in the middle of the arena where nobody was around. Mm -hmm. I said, let me tell you something worthless. I won't use the language I did. Yes, but I said, Kevin Sullivan is your biggest pusher. I said, I said not to put the world title on you. J.J. Dillon said not to put the world title on you. But Kevin is your biggest pusher. He did that on his own. Joey Jojo Jr. Shabadoo from the Crap Forum. What was the first moment in WCW where you thought, I want out? Uh, when they fired Eric, I guess, and Kevin was taking over the book because Kevin didn't feel that there was money in us, so we knew we wouldn't be used, you know. And it, I, I don't, you can't, I, you can't fault Kevin for that if he doesn't think that he can do a storyline that uh, can make money with us. Then that's his right. Mm -hmm. What I fault him for is he'd look at you in your face and tell you, oh, no, it's not me, it's this guy, it's that guy, all the backstab and lying bullshit. If he's the booker, he's responsible to make the company money. And if the company doesn't make money, he's going to get fired. So if he didn't think he could make money with us, I have no problem with mm -hmm. that at all, you know. And, but I, it's the fact how they do it. They lie to your face and backstab you behind your back. Like uh, we're, I was working with Rick Steiner, so he figured he thought he'd get Rick Steiner to beat me up. He told Rick Steiner that I was trying to get uh, Hacksaw Duggan fired because I didn't want to work with Hacksaw Duggan, which all that is a lie. Not knowing, not knowing Sullivan's such a fucking idiot, not knowing that Rick is going to come right up to me and ask me what's going on. And I tell him, I go, no, that didn't happen. He did something with Sid. Sid come up to me and said, hey, Perry, Ke Kevin said... I don't remember what it was you said this. And I go, I've been at Sid's house. I, you know, I didn't fucking say that. Mm -hmm. But see, he'd like to cause problems. So, yeah, he's a, like, and just lying like uh, me and...
Chris were the WCW Tag Team Champions, and, and when Eric wasn't there, he'd put us in single matches doing the job, and we would bitch and go, well, why aren't we defending the titles? You know, Eric said we're supposed to be defending the titles. He go, well, Eric's not here. This is what we're doing. If you don't like it, get a hold of Eric. So eventually, I got Eric's cell phone number, and then I would call Eric, and I'd say, Eric, uh, we're not tagging together. We're doing He'd go, put fucking Sullivan on the phone. I'd give Sullivan the phone. Then we'd be tagging together going over. So there was big heat there because of that. Because I got, and I would call Eric on vacation and shit and go, Eric, he has me working with so-and-so, Chris working with some so-and-so. We're both jobbing. And he'd go, no, I told him you guys were defending the belts and you're going over. And I, well, no, that's not what, you go, give him the phone. Well, this leads us into Matthew Carl from Syracuse's question. Perry, on Kayfabe Commentaries, Kevin Sullivan and the end of WCW disc, available at kayfabecommentaries.com. Uh, trying to help you out, Sean, thank you. Spelled my name wrong, though. Uh, he states that he was great to all of you guys and even went as far as putting the title on He Who Shall Not Be Named, Benoit. Uh, what's the truth? Um, he says he was great to you guys. The truth is that when Russo was there doing the storylines, this happened. This was how the heat got with Mike Graham and us because uh, Russo would have us in a match. He'd have us going over. Sullivan and Mike Graham would be the agent. They'd come to us and they would switch the finish where we're doing the job. We'd come back and Russo would go, what the fuck? Why did you guys do the job? Because that because that's what they told us to where we to where we would only have Arn as our agent because Arn was the only one giving us the finish they wanted us to do so they're liars uh, Sullivan and, and Mike are fucking liars there's no way around that you can ask Russo about this they would switch the fucking finish and have us doing the job which I don't care you see over my career I've done a million jobs I've done the job more than I've gone over I don't care I don't got an ego about that shit but then don't do it to where you try to get me heat you know like uh, that's bullshit like uh, I worked with Sid that when they were calling him the Millennium Man and Eric wasn't at the TV and they um, they Sullivan laid out the match to me and uh, he had Sid squash me and I go no I'm not doing that there's no way I go I'll go out there back and forth and we'll go over and, and so then they changed the finish and they had Steiner run in this big thing and, but uh, Kevin got on the phone with Eric and told Eric that I went out there I ate up Sid and I refused to do the job well Eric called me right up and asked me what happened I go no that's not what fucking happened see they're fucking liars are we starting to get the big picture here? These two guys, like Perry Saturn said, they're liars. And listening to the things that Kevin Sullivan would lie about just to start problems with people, just to try and start problems with Perry Saturn and Rick Steiner, Perry Saturn and Sid Vicious. The amount of lies the man would tell is telling of his character and who he is. And the fact that he loves to start problems I think that tells you more than enough of what you need to know about Kevin Sullivan. My Graham as well. And, you know, I find it in, in, in listening to that interview, the, the clips I've been playing of my Graham, there's a part I've left out up until this point. And it's the part where he threatened Chris Benoit's life. Take a listen. I said, now here's the difference between Kevin and I. If you had taken my wife, I would kick your ass Every time I saw you for the rest of your life, that's what I'd do. But I said, now, now that you've tried to take my job because I'm Kevin's friend and you want to fire me, I said, I'll cut your fucking head off mm. and put it on a stick in front of your house for all the kids to throw rocks at. I said, I'm not the guy to mess with. The fact that Mike Graham would so openly admit to something like that threatening to cut Benoit's head off and put it on a stick for the kids to throw rocks at. You made a death threat to this man, and you're in an interview openly bragging about it as if you're so tough for doing so. And the reason that he said it is because if you had took my wife like you did Kevin, well, according to Kevin, it didn't bother him, but we know at this point Kevin's a liar. Just like we know at this point Mike's a liar. They're both liars. And it's like, y'all y'all put Chris Benoit through hell. Y'all literally try to sabotage his career and get some, some, some sort of revenge for him taking Nancy from Kevin. And so to, to portray this story that Kevin Sullivan treated Benoit so good, it's a complete lie. Why go to all that effort to lie so much about it? Mike Graham makes it very clear the real story, even though he's a liar, 
he couldn't help himself to express the anger he had towards Chris Benoit. And if you don't think Kevin Sullivan had that same anger, you're a fool. And it all goes back to the question, why even lie in the first place? But it's like Perry Saturn said, Kevin Sullivan was such a liar that he would intentionally try to start shit with Perry Saturn, Rick Steiner, Saturn, Sid Vicious, all the, a lot of the guys in the back that he was intentionally trying to start problems with because that's what Kevin Sullivan's all about. So you can't take Kevin or Mike Graham at their word for anything. And that leads me to the Sid Vicious thing. Or Kevin said, oh, you know, he's all upset. You know how hard it was to tell Sid Vicious he had to lose to Benoit? Sid was like, I got to lose to a midget. Why don't we get Sid's recount of this? I remember them coming to me, Terry Taylor, at the gym that day. He goes, well, you know, we're going to put Chris over you today. and He's going to take the belt. I said, I don't care. You know, I don't think it's a good decision, but it don't bother me at all. So during the match, they, you know, when they're going over, they came to me and said, Sid, when he puts that cross face on you, we want you to slip your leg under the bottom rope. I didn't know why. I just did what I was asked. So then as soon as we came to the curtains, they fired him, you know. And I don't know why they did that to fire him, but they did. So a couple of things here. What Sid said about them telling him to put his foot under the rope goes in line with what Perry Saturn was saying about my grandma Kevin Sullivan changing the finishes. And that's exactly what they did there with Sid Vicious. Oh, put your foot under the rope. And, and Sid says once they got backstage, meaning this was Sunday night, January 16th, 2000, WCW sold out. When Chris Benoit won the title right after he won it, got in the back, they fired him on the spot. Not this garbage that Mike Graham said where it was the next day and Bill Bush comes in and explains to them how there's a petition. Like there's no debate on there being a petition. You know, that's from multiple sources. There was a petition. Chris Benoit, Perry Saturn, Dean Malenko, um, Shane Douglas, they all wanted to get Kevin Sullivan fired. So there's no debate there. But why Mike Graham would say it was the next day and Sid Vicious is telling you no. As we, when I walked through the curtains, they fired him right there. I saw it. More lies. What's the need to lie about that? And then on top of this, Sid says, you know, they told me that I was going to be losing to Chris Benoit. He said, uh, I didn't think it was the right decision or I didn't agree with the decision. But I, didn't, I, I, I had no problem doing it. I'll put him over. I'll do what you guys are asking me to do. Not this hard little story that Kevin Sullivan's telling where, do you know how hard it was to sell, tell Sid he had to lose to Benoit? It didn't sound like it was too hard for Terry Taylor to tell him. So where does the lying end? Do you think they're going to lie about these little things and Kevin Sullivan's going to admit that he knew about or had something to do with the killing of Benoit, Nancy, and Daniel? Do you think he would admit something like that while lying about little petty shit? Because I don't think so. Narcissistic liars, they tend to lie about everything. And you can best believe Mike Graham, and I know he's gone, and Kevin Sullivan, both were narcissistic liars, and Kevin Sullivan probably still is one. Those are the facts. Now, I want to end this video because I know I told y'all in the first episode about the day Eddie Guerrero had a heart attack or they portrayed it as him having a heart attack on SmackDown, <clears throat> May 20th, 2004. That was one day before Chris Benoit's 37th birthday. Well, my grandma, as we all know, committed suicide. And I've put together a little, a little something to show you some interesting date. Well, I would say dates, but it's only one specific date about what happened and whose birthday was the day after my Graham died. So here it is, just like I said. Michael Gossett, better known as Mike Graham, was an American professional wrestler who was the son of Eddie Graham. Born September 22nd, 1951, died October 19th, 2012. Now you'll remember when I showed y'all that Eddie Guerrero had the fake heart attack or collapse in the ring on SmackDown. That was May 20th. One day before Chris Benoit's 37th birthday. Why don't we see how close to somebody else's birthday my Graham died, died on? 
Chavo Guerrero IV, better known as Chavo Guerrero and Chavo Guerrero Jr., is an American professional wrestler, promoter, and actor. Born October 20th, 1970. October 20th, what happened the day before his birthday in 2012? My Graham died. And the same Chavo Guerrero that changed his story when it comes to Eddie Guerrero, and as we'll get into a little bit later on in, the, in another episode, actually changed his story and timeline when it comes to Chris Benoit. Chavo Guerrero is another shady character in all of this. And I'll tell you all, by the time I'm done, this is just the beginning. This is just the, the start of the facts that I have found. And I know there's going to be some people that chalk it up as, oh, it's just coincidence. But to see, the problem is, this keeps happening. The dates, not only the dates, but the facts and the investigation, how they contradict themselves. District Attorney Scott Ballard constantly contradicting himself. It's complete disaster. A complete joke, that investigation was. And when you look at things like this, you know, there are such, such a thing as serial killers, and they love to leave clues. So let's not pretend as if it's out of the realm of possibility, because it is absolutely not. Who are the killers? We're going we're gonna to elaborate as we go on. And I'm not saying Arn Anderson killed Crispin. Well, I think for sure Arn Anderson knew something. I think for sure Chavo Guerrero knew more than he's talking about, more than he's leading on. I think he knew because he was at Crispin Benoit's house the weekend before all that stuff went down. Michael Benoit, Chris's father, talked to him that Sunday, meaning the, the, the prior Sunday on Father's Day. Prior to what happened June 22nd, 23rd, 24th. And said Chris was upset because he was on the road. He wanted to be home with his family. When you want to kill your family. Are you, you you're planning on leaving this earth as the apparent suicide note said. Although we don't have any proof that Chris wrote that. You, you got to keep in mind. Most of the quote unquote facts. Then quote unquote Evidence that they say points to Chris doing it is something that anybody could have done and planted as evidence. Looking up how to revive Daniel. Anybody could do that on a computer. Unless you've got video footage of him typing it or something like that. Y'all don't have shit. Y'all have nothing. And that's the whole point in all of this. It's innocent until proven guilty. Chris Benoit was never proven guilty. There was just a bunch of scrambling and a bunch of people involved trying to come up with any reason to say that Chris did it. It was steroids. Then it was CTE. Then it's, you know, it's the brain damage. Oh, he, maybe he just snapped. Well, maybe this happened and maybe that. It's a lot of maybe this, maybe that. No real fact. Well, what I can tell you is the facts that I'm putting out and the facts that I'm putting forth put a lot of holes in these so-called facts from the prosecutors. Does, are, are you people aware that there's people in law enforcement in Fayetteville, Georgia? And there's people that I have talked to because I'm in a group of you know, of people from Fayetteville, Georgia. And they say that they know people that were involved in the investigation and they say that it was a sham of an investigation. They say that it was not done properly at all. The, they actually say the investigation needs to be reopened. And that's the ultimate goal of this whole series. I want to petition to reopen the Chris Benoit case. I'm not I'm not one of these people that just want to talk. I actually want to do something about it. But in order to do that, I will need support. In order to do that, 
we will all have to come together, those that do think Chris Benoit is innocent. And we will have to do something about that. But yeah, with everything I have provided in this video, the fact that Kevin Sullivan is a liar, the fact of my Graham making death threats, I think you have motive. I think I have proven that there are people who would want Chris dead. But again, that's not it. In the next episode, we're going to continue our little journey. We're going to continue to expose things. And don't get me wrong, I think many people were involved in this. And that's why it's taken so long for me to get to the end. Because I think this was planned out, and I think it was planned out for quite some time. Thank you guys for watching. See you later.